Hello there. As those of you who saw my last video are aware, uh, my book is now a real object in the physical primary world. Uh, it is no longer something that's a secondary uh, creation in my mind uh, or a shadow on the wall of a cave. Um, it's listed on the Kent State University website as available to order. Um, there will be an ebook. It doesn't seem to be uh, the ebook doesn't seem to be available at Kent State just yet. Uh, as for other places where you might buy it, you know the places I'm talking about. Everything from the retail giants to the you know small local bookshop, you know. And uh, if you're going to order it uh, from one of the, the the big places, you know, like. Waterstones, Barnes and Noble, something like that. I'd encourage you to go into the store and do it rather than to do it online, because the people who work in those physical stores are just as local as the people who work in in, in the small community bookstores. You know, they pay rent, they have to buy food, all that sort of stuff. I say this as somebody who used to do it, you know, and and so I know that. Uh, that people tend to think of, oh, well, it's these big corporate giants. And that's true. And that's true. But the people who work in the stores are your neighbors. Uh, and so, uh, you know, maybe they deserve some of your support, too. At the same time, I'm all for supporting uh, local stores. Uh, local is the way to go, whether it's your local uh, Waterstones, Barnes & Noble, whatever, or your local independent bookstore. I would go into the store, if you possibly can, to order it because that does them the biggest favor uh, and, and, and helps them out. And the more bookstores, the better. So today, I'm going to actually read to you from the book itself. Uh, we're up to chapter 8 in our, uh, in our review of, of some of the, of, the, of, the, of the contents of each chapter and uh, uh, an excerpt from that chapter. So I'll just get started here uh, in the introduction where I summarize chapter 8. In chapter 8, Faramir's outright rejection of the power no mortal can resist, and Gollum's wavering momentarily between villainy and repentance, highlight the questions of identity and self-deception as the gap narrows between Frodo's acceptance of the ring as his burden and his desire to use it. The seeming wisdom of his realization that he cannot yet challenge the Witch King is vitiated by the self-deception on which that realization rests, namely that he will soon be able to do so, a delusion that adumbrates the direct challenge to Sauron implicit in his, claim, in his claiming the ring as his own. For the moment, Frodo's deteriorating identity can still be called back by memories of the Shire and the light in Galadriel's file. The scene of Gollum's near repentance underscores that love. That love, like pity, can counteract the ring's effects, if only for a time. Depending on the rootedness of the love and one's capacity for unflinching self-knowledge. Gollum fails in this regard. But Sam will succeed when his moment comes. Okay, so there's the uh, uh, there's the summary of the entire chapter. The entire chapter, uh, chapter eight, is known is called from Ithilien to Kirth Ungol. Um, so uh, and, and you know it covers the, the the movement of their journey along you know in, for, between those points. Uh, the subsection I'm going to be reading from today is uh, called A Hobbit's Got to Know His Limitations. And I hope somebody out there gets that. Um, so, from chapter 8, A Hobbit's Got to Know His Limitations. At the crossroads, when Frodo sees the flowers growing round the fallen statue's brows, he takes it for a sign that a day will come when Sauron fails. He here shows a prophetic quality and a hopeful resolve in strong contrast to the despair he had felt before the Black Gate. From this last moment of Ithilien's loveliness, made more poignant by its precarity in the falling darkness, Frodo takes a measure of defiance, 
which the immediately renewed burden of the ring overwhelms, but doesn't quite drown. For turning eastward and crossing the road, he walks out of the Athelion of Faramir and enters a darker Athelion, a forest dominated and warped by the sorcery of Minas Morgul. Morgul, of course, means black magic or sorcery, and the Tower of Sorcery was once the Tower of the Moon, Minas Ithil, which lent its name to the land on both sides of the road. When Faramir longs for Minas Tirith to become Minas Anor once more, he is wishing for the time before Minas Ithil fell to the Ringwraiths. Unlike the light of sun and moon evoked in the names Minas Anor and Minas Ithil, Minas Morgul is full of light, but it is corpse light, a tower tall but not high, loathsome not fair, ruled by the Witch King, who is a slave to the One Ring. Frodo even suggests to Faramir that if the Ring went to Minas Tirith, it would become a second Minas Morgul. Faramir does not disagree. What Frodo encounters as he approaches Minas Morgul is perhaps the clearest demonstration we have of the narrow difference between power used to dominate and power used to preserve or inspire. In Lorien, Galadriel conjures to hold back the tides of time, and her enchantments succeed so well that in the golden wood the elder days live on. And, as is often the case for mortals and fairy, the passage of a month seems but a few days. The spells of Morgul, however, corrupt what was good and beautiful of old, and seem to slow time, quote, so that between the raising of a foot and the setting of it down, minutes of loathing passed. In Lorien, the waters of the Nimrodel comfort the grieving with their music and refresh the weary with their touch. The stream in Morgul Vale has no voice, and its vapor dispirits and disorients them. Morgul's pale white flowers are linked, are likened to something out of a nightmare and reek of death. Frodo will remember the white Nifredel of Lorien as in a waking dream, long after he has left the Golden Wood. Yet, however kindly the intent, the desire to preserve entails domination. Whether the domination aims at controlling the fundaments of nature by withstanding the passage of time, or at saving the Shire from the Dark Lord, any desire of this kind leaves the would-be preserver more vulnerable to the pull of the ring's power. Indeed, Saruman's fall may, be, may well be evidence of just how profoundly he had once wanted to save Middle-earth, if his corruption took place at such a distance. Gandalf's statement to Denethor that were the ring buried beneath the roots of Mindaloin, still it would burn your mind away, should be seen in the same light. And Gandalf says this directly after telling Denethor that he had refused the ring even as a gift because he knew what it would do to him. By contrast, we may again consider Faramir. With no hope of victory, he sees Gondor as without a future. And when he tells Frodo what he would see, he expresses a wish he believes unattainable. This attitude, a peculiar mixture of love, hopelessness, and a desire to serve what he loves, confers an initial resistance to the draw of the ring. Peculiar, but not unique. For Faramir and Sam are very much alike in this regard, as we shall see when even Sam's quality is put to the proof. So that's chapter eight. We're running out of chapters, and maybe by next week the uh, the book will be more widely available. Uh, and let's hope that that's true. And I just want to thank. And I know I've done this before, but it, 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 you folks continue to amaze me with the 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 the, the kindness uh, and generosity you have shown in 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 congratulating me, in 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 thanking me, in 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 urging me on. Uh, in 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 all sorts of ways, uh, I am I am continually floored uh, by the reactions that um, you know the pieces of my book and my and my uh, and, and 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 the coming of the book uh, you know 
inspire. Thank you so much. Uh, I, you know, it's it's uh, it's 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 a wonderful thing. You know, uh, it's it 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 makes writing the book pay itself off in 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 in, in spades. So uh, thank you, uh, all of you, uh, and uh, and we'll see you uh, we'll see you next time.